I thought that almost everything that I had read about combat psychology did not make any sense in the light of my combat experience. And so I started, I'm, you know, I work at a university, so I, I uh, j- did a master's degree on combat psychology and, and my, my undergraduate was in natural sciences. So with that being said, that's a little bit different take than the, most of the world of psychology has. So I'm, I'm like, uh, I would kind of give you the background on, on, on uh, basic human combat psychology. Mm-hmm. So, so imagine this, for example, we're biological organisms and everything about us is the product of, of, you know, evolution and people, um, our ancestors breeding and raising children successfully all the way back 3.8 billion years or something like that. So, so whenever I heard that, you know, combat was, uh, causing PTSD and et cetera, that didn't make any sense to me in, in that light. Imagine that everything in nature, everything in nature dies a horrible death. Everything in nature lives until it gets eaten alive. So, mm-hmm. so how is it that we are all of a sudden suffering trauma and it's this devastating thing for our species only? Is it because of cognition? So, so there's this idea that out there and this was Dave Grossman's idea that that humans don't have fight or flight. They have fight or flight posture or submit. And there's a grain of truth in that. But it's also off. And what he thought was that that was because humans had an inherent reticence to kill other humans. I think a cursory glance at history shows that not to be true. Humans have no problem killing other humans. I can, I, uh, there's more to that story, but I, I think that that's not true but the 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 uh, fight or flight posture or submit idea has a grain of truth in it and that is in male hierarchical fighting okay so in social animals males uh, compete and form hierarchies and they do that so they can dominate resources specifically females okay so so that's the truth like in lobsters and crickets and sea lions and many kinds of birds, social animals, that's how they do it. And so in that take, there is, you know, imagine two lobsters come against each other. If you, anybody here on here has listened to Jordan Peterson before, he always describes this one thing. You know, lobsters come against each other. If they've never seen another lobster in their life, two males will first posture. One will raise, they'll raise their claws up and try to look big, scare the other one off. One of them small, he'll scare them off. And they've established a hierarchy. If they mm-hmm. don't, if, the, if they're about the same size, then they wrestle. They grab each other by the claws and they try to flip each other over. If one of them flips the other one over, they've established a hierarchy and he'll, he'll you know, scurry away. And if that doesn't, hap- doesn't work, then they fight. And when they really fight, they try to, you know, pull each other's eyes off and stuff. And so they will both take damage. So that's mm-hmm. why they have these, I, these other mechanisms to avoid that, right? So, so with that being said... You know, crickets have almost the same thing, you know, et cetera. So do two tough guys in a bar. So do guys getting in the UFC. That is all male hierarchical fighting, okay? So with that being said, there's truth in that, except there are certain species, namely wolves, chimpanzees, human beings, who have adopted what are called male coalition reproductive strategies. So male coalition reproductive strategy, imagine a pack of wolves, right? Mm-hmm. So within their pack, they do just as we've described male hierarchical fighting because the pack is stronger if all the males live. Okay. Mm-hmm. But between two packs, they have war and mm-hmm. they don't have any mm-hmm. reticence to kill each other. They will, but what they do is they, they have a tendency to try to win by ambush and stuff like that. So they try to fight when they only, when they know they're going to win. Okay. And so that's actually if you look at first the rates of death uh, in conspecific meaning of the same species violence between wolves and chimpanzees and hunter gatherer humans, they're almost the same. And mm. the, the, the modes of warfare are almost the same as well. Hunter gatherer humans fight the same way wolves do. They try not to, they try to fight only when they know they're going to win. They do ambushes, they do raids, they patrol their territory. 
you know, if you look at Native American tribes, you know, when the Sioux Indians were fighting against against the Arapaho or whatever, that's the same way they fought. It's the same way wolves fought. And that's what our actual psyche was designed for is that type of fighting. So to so get rid of the idea that humans have an inherent reticence to kill other humans. We don't. We have an inherent reticence to kill other humans within our pack. We mm-hmm. we form our we form in groups and out groups and we're the people who are in our out group we're happy to kill, you know, as far as our psyche. Now, just to kind of give how that evolved beyond that into what we have today, imagine um, the size of a wolf pack is optimized for war. So what I mean by that is if you say, okay, here's the, what is the optimum number of wolves for hunting? And that number ends up being like four or something like that. So if that, what that means optimized for hunting is if you had a fifth one, then they would no longer be optimized for hunting and each of them would take a nutritional deficit because they have one too many to be optimized, right? Mm -hmm. So, however, when a pack of five runs into a pack of four in this war we were just talking about, the five will win at a predictable rate. So therefore they they keep the five, the fifth, because it gives them an advantage in war. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if they have a sixth, it will get an advantage too. And if they have a seventh, it will give an advantage. So what they really do is they grow to be large enough to be dominant in war. But the limiting factor on how big they can be is nutrition. So they max out at like 29, 36, something like that, but based upon the terrain they're in and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And so, so optimized for war, but limited by nutrition. Chimpanzees are the same way. Human hunter-gatherers are the same way. Our optimum size is like 150 or so. So with that being said, what if you have the morality that's going on within a, a society where everybody's involved in war, okay, imagine that. Just sort of humans, this is the sort of Piagetian idea of how we come up with our ideas or our morale, morality. Humans develop morality in two methods as children. One is the methods are both games, right? Mm -hmm. So one style, one style of game is cooperative competitive games. So imagine a game of hockey or football or something. So are they competing or are they cooperating? Well, they're actually doing both, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're, they're competing, but they're cooperating about what the rules are and how they're going to compete. Mm -hmm. So that that's like a microcosm of society, right? So that's what we're all actually doing. We're all agreeing on the rules. That's our laws, et cetera, and our, our, our moral rules and everything. And then we're competing within those rules for the bigger house, the better looking girl, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So that's one type of game where we're developing our morality or how we get along, you know? And then the other type is, is role playing games. So imagine, when two little girls are playing house and one of them is the mommy, she's not mimicking her mommy. What she's really doing is she's acting out the abstraction of what it means to be a mommy, right? Mm-hmm. So that means humans can think in abstractions. This is where we gain that ability. You know, we're like the only animal that does that. So with that being said, if you, if you, once you have that idea of abstractions, you can look at a, across a, 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 a society and if you can, if you asked every member of that society, what was the qualities that described the best possible man or the best possible woman, right? So that's an abstraction of what it means to be a hero or mm. the best possible person. Well, in a warlike society where, you know, we're like wolves or chimpanzees or hunter-gatherer man, everybody's involved in fighting. That abstraction is going to be, is going to be um, somebody good at war. It's certainly not going to be somebody peaceful because they have no use yeah. for that person. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm. So, so that's why you have like in even in societies where they're closer to war, you have heroes and whatnot. They're like that. So I'll give you a sort of, um, well, let me keep continue with the story. So then imagine what happens then is that humans 10,000 years ago invented hunting. I mean, invented farming. So when they invented farming, the net result was, that we continue to be optimized for war, but we're allowed to 
we because we didn't have the nutritional deficit, we were allowed to have larger and larger coalitions. Mm -hmm. So instead of 150, we had had 1,500, 15,000, 15 million. Now we got 300 million people in the United States, right? So, so our coalitions got much bigger. And what that allowed was the specialization of society, so that the percentage of people actually doing the fighting became smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay, so what percentage of people in our 300 man, 300 million people in the United States are actually involved in the fighting? That number is minuscule, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. our population at large is generating those abstractions of what it means to be a good person and imposing mm -hmm. them on the people who, well, your kids grow up in it, right? Yep. So then you, so then you go to war and it turns out that's all bullshit. Because <laughs> war hasn't changed any, right? Yeah. People are still getting a fist rate like they were whenever the Vikings were raiding the coast of of England and whatever the and if you go watch what happens among chimpanzees and wolves whenever they fight each other in wars, it's just like that still. Mm. Okay. Only we have this abstraction, this this morality that's created by people who don't have to confront the realities of the world or who yeah. don't live in the in the world that's real. Okay, so have so we have on the one, sheltered from it. That's exactly right. So, so what we have then is, you know, so this, there's, there's a thing called moral injuries, right? And so moral injuries are when, or when your deeply held beliefs are shattered by things that happen to you, or things mm -hmm. you do even. Okay, so, so that's an illustration of how that happens. How do you get these deeply held beliefs? Well, your parents who've never been to war, your, your, all your friends who've never been to war, your preacher who's never been to war, your school guidance counselor and all your teachers who've never been to war, they produce a morality that doesn't, that it doesn't jive with the real world, an expectation that you would, even our ideas of heroism. So that, that um, remember I was telling you about uh, the, the, uh, hunter gatherer humans fight with the same mm. methods, but that's mm. not how we fight in civilized armies, is it? No. Because the because our ideas of heroism and whatnot are c created by people who are not involved. Mm. Mm. So so we don't we no longer fight only when we think we're going to win. Wolves don't call one of the other wolves a coward when he runs. They expect him to because that's what they would, you know, that's what they would do too, and they've all been there. Mm. So mm. so now. Go back to how we fought wars in the classic era when you had, you know, 20,000 men walking across the field in step. That yeah. is not in keeping with their actual psyche, right? Well, well World War One was a great, it was a, was a great uh, learning curve for a lot of the traditional armies at that point. I mean, exactly. even, even just things like, uh, like uh, officers being visually different um, and easily identifiable. <laughs> that, well, that even then, I mean, imagine, and... imagine the generals that run the wars, right? Just, mm -hmm. just we're staying within the army now. Now, this is, this is uh, you know, we've already established that the people who do the fighting are a small subset, specialized subset of the society. Mm. And and the people who actually are up on the line doing the fighting, they're a small subset of that group, mm. right? So even the people who are running the show, you know, look at the commanders of our armies now. We've been at war for 15 years now, 15 years. How many people who have commanded brigades, divisions, you know, the, the, the war in general, have been involved in a fight at the platoon level? Mm -hmm. That number's almost no one, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 so even within the group of people who are supposedly the fighters, the morality is dictated by the people who are not really the fighters. Mm. You know, our That's ideas, it. yeah, our abstractions of what we would, of what we would expect of each other and of ourselves. Now, I'll give you a way that plays an example of how that plays out. So, you ever get on uh, the internet and look at the, all the gunfights that cops get in, right? Mm -hmm. So one one of the things that happens routinely is that cops will be confronting somebody or walking up to a car and the person in that car pulls the gun out and the gunfight starts like that, right? Yep. So almost always what happens is the cop will immediately panic. And then once he gets his you know, mind right, he'll come back into the fight, right? Mm -hmm. So so think about this for, for, for a second, right? Humans... Let me back up. Not humans. 
are not only humans. All animals, all animals deal with threats along a threat eminence continuum. And what that means is that, imagine we're two gazelles and we're sitting out in the grass eating grass and we smell a lion. What will we do? Well, our brain activity will remain in our prefrontal cortex and we'll try to outsmart the lion. We'll say, oh, look, maybe if we walk over here where the grass is shorter, he won't be able to ambush us. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that what's going on is that we're thinking about it, right? But if that lion were to jump out of the grass and attack us, the brain activity leaves the prefrontal cortex, goes to the hypothalamus, and we panic. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that is not any different than what happens to that cop at that moment, right? Mm -hmm. When he, when that, he is surprised, that means that the threat is, that's called a circus strike whenever it's talking about uh, other animals besides humans, because we have this conceit that we're different, right? But we're not actually different. (coughs) So what happens is the same thing that happens to those gazelles, right? So gazelles are not probably a very good example, but just a, for, as the way it is with cops, but imagine this. So imagine a herd of Cape Buffalo and the lion jumps out of the weeds at that herd. The toughest, biggest, meanest bulls in that herd will all panic exactly like those gazelles would have, right? Mm-hmm. The difference is as soon as they're clear of the initial thing, they will turn around and come back and fight off the lion. Mm-hmm. So that's mm-hmm. exactly what that cop is going through. Exactly the same thing. Yeah, so wow. our, our experiences in war, they parallel experiences that we're evolved for in many ways. Okay, so, so look at those two gazelles getting ambushed like that. They're not much different than soldiers driving along, uh, you know, in a convoy who get, you know, in a complex ambush. It's the same thing going on mentally, the same processes. Note also that those mental processes are completely different than what's going on with the lion. So the lion's hunting, right? He's just hungry. So mm-hmm. his brain activity stays in his prefrontal cortex the whole time. Even when he's engaged in the fight, right? He's like making a judgment call on whether or not this is going his way. And if it's not going his way, he'll disengage, right? Mm-hmm. Never panicking because he's the hunter. So compare the combat experiences of somebody who's like in the Ranger Regiment or some counter-terror unit who are going out every night on pulling raids. Their combat experience is nothing like the gazelles. It's everything like the lions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they're, uh, you know what I mean? Yeah, they're, they're on the, they've got the initiative. They're, um, right. They're not, yeah. And it totally changes the brain activity, what, even what portions of the brain are being affected. And our brains are laid out much the same as they are, as they are in all mammals, you know. But it's worth noting that that behavior comes before cognition, right? So imagine the crickets don't have brains, so to speak, but they still behave. Okay, so mm-hmm. humans behave before we think as well. So behavior is first, and then cognition second, right? Wow. So. Yep. That's why most. That's why the two tough guys at the bar are going through the exact same thing as the two lobsters are. They're doing yeah. exactly the same, thing, right? And we're not. And, and look, why are the lobsters fighting? It's an interesting thing, right? Why are the lobsters fighting? Well, lobster females molt whenever they have babies, and so they're mm-hmm. vulnerable. So lobster males fight over to caves, right? Whoever's got the best cave. So mm-hmm. the toughest guy gets the best cave. That's the one all the females want. In mm-hmm. other words. Mm-hmm. In other words, the ladies want the man with the biggest house. (laughs) It's not any different, right? Like we are absolutely not different. And it's dictated by the same, it's dictated by the same neurotransmitters as well. You know, that that's, I'm not the first one coming up with that, but they're, you know, you can use, you can use antidepressant medicines, give them to lobsters who've lost fights and they're ready to fight again. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, whenever they lose a fight, then they're much more likely to lose the next fight and the next fight after that because their brain, the chemicals in it that happen when losing this, their serotonin levels drop and their mm-hmm. brain, what little it have, it reconfigures itself. And that's not too different than what's going on with PTSD. You suffer this, you suffer this uh, 
you know, like, like the cop who panics and he's been taught that he was a stud and thought of himself as a stud the whole way. Meanwhile, he does exactly what was predictable, mm -hmm. just like those tough Cape Buffaloes, you know, nobody's saying the Cape Buffalo bulls who fought off a lion isn't tough, right? They are. That doesn't mean they won't panic. It just yep. means that they're going to rally and come back. So, you know, it's like the, the, the sheepdog analogy that gets blown around a lot. You know, like, mm -hmm. I don't like that analogy very much because I know why I know why I use it, you know, the, and it, it's got some, it's got some usefulness, but think about this, you know, why do the sheepdogs protect the sheep? It isn't because they give a crap about sheep. Mm. Right? They don't care about sheep. They love the shepherd. Mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of a Christian mm -hmm. analogy that works. If people who are, who have that. So, you know, you can love the shepherd and, and protect the flock. Right. But mm. what, what happens with the sheepdogs whenever the shepherd's away? Mm. Well, they screw with the sheep. <laughs> 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 they don't care about sheep. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's not too different. Right. So <laughs> I like, the, I like the Cape Buffalo analogy better because why do the Cape Buffalo protect the cows and the calves? Well, they protect them because they love them. It's their mm. herd. Mm. Right? It's a way better analogy. And what do they do? There's no shepherd involved. They're doing it out of love for each other. Yeah. So that's fascinating. Anyway, that's that, that's the rudiments of it. There's a, there's a whole lot to be. Uh, we we know, need to do another episode just on that. That's, okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, there, I, I, there's so I, many so many things I'd love to bat around on that on that topic. I think that I think the walk the takeaway on that though is that a that a realistic approach to the psychology of combat. Uh, means is that we have to develop moral systems that allow us to be able to fight wars and win and defend the innocent in our society and win. And it has to jive with the realities of the world. Our, our iconography and our abstractions that we use to mean what it means to be a, a good person, they have to be, they have to jive with the world. And they have to jive with their own psychology so that when we're that person who suffers that circus strike, just like those gazelles, and we panic, we don't beat ourselves up about it because it mm -hmm. was to be expected. What we beat ourselves up is did we come back and fight because that, that just like that Cape Buffalo. And if you take it to that analogy, you know, look, whenever the cop gets the call from across town and he's racing across, right? So he's not going through the same thing as the person who was ambushed mentally, yeah. Yeah. you know, and from the perspective of how we, you know, like I'm not a psychologist, right? So psychologists are help givers They're They want to help people. They're like doctors. So, so I, that's not how I am at all. What I would like to do is I would like to make sure that we develop training and fighting methods and techniques and abilities that prepare us so that we don't suffer the consequences of the, of the our training being unrealistic and i mean by that even our mental training yeah 100 uh, percent. and i think uh one, one thing that i have struggled to get across uh well, well maybe i struggled but one, one of the things that, that i go to pains to try and emphasize to quote unquote regular people <laughs> who, are, who are undertaking training is that you can't apply your your moral compass to the person you are defending yourself against because if they had the same values as you they wouldn't be defending you <laughs> you wouldn't be defending yourself they, they wouldn't be attacking you so well, look you know i'll give you an example so way shiba founder of aikido you know he had a reputation as a tough guy up into his 50s mm. and then he had sort of a religious enlightenment and and what he figured out was that if you draw out the moral plane the lowest level being i attack you for no reason Next level up is that I think you may attack me someday, so I attack you preemptively. Um, if you keep that drawing that moral plane out, the highest level is they attack you. Not only do you not let them hurt you, but you make sure you don't hurt them, right? Yeah. So, so that's a moral system, okay? Mm. So, and in fact, if I would argue that Aikido is not really a martial art in the perspective of it's not really focused on winning fights. It's focused on teaching that morality, that moral lesson. So that's mm. wonderful. It's a perfectly appropriate thing for a martial art to do, right? Or a perfectly appropriate answer. You know, we... At West Point, we use athletics, fighting, boxing, swimming, you know, combatives, all that to teach the warrior ethos and to teach people to be better people in the same way that gym teachers all around the world do in the same that way that Kano 
one of a judo, right? Mm. I would just say that if we, if we can look, if we can understand real human psychology, we can make sure that. So, so imagine in the warlike society of the Vikings, their iconography that that was Odin, you know. Mm. So, so the and in the warlike societies of the Middle Ages, they still had Jesus, but the what they imposed upon jesus was their value set of this this uh so it's not the same jesus yeah that, that launched the crusades that's uh you know now almost you know like gandhi with the pacifism you know what i mean yeah so yeah. so it's it's so that's not to assault anybody's religion you know i'm, I'm trying not to but I, what i would say is that you know a a, a deeper view and in, in a an open-minded deeper view would tell you that person who's who's trying to impart their moral values on you if they're not somebody who knows the realities of the world then maybe mm-hmm. they don't know exactly maybe exactly. their version of it i have a buddy who's a preacher in the in the army and he always used to say you know as an example uh whenever the romans came to get jesus and and uh when one of the disciples whipped out his sword, lopped one of their ears off. Nobody said, "Hey, where'd you get that?" <laughs> <laughs> because they were carrying swords, right? So, yeah, so yeah. you know, and that's just something that you're not going to hear in the in the you know the many churches today because the, because the person who's giving the lesson doesn't understand the world of two thousand years ago. And therefore, doesn't understand the iconography of that era. Yeah, 